welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Guha Thakurta, and today's topic of discussion is how anti terror laws are implemented, misused, used, and whether these laws, the manner in which they are implemented, they work against particular groups, minorities in particular, and whether they curtail civil liberties. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Shailashri Shankar. She's a senior fellow of the Center for Policy Research. She's been studying anti-terror laws for some time now. And her book titled Scaling Justice was published in 2009 by the Oxford University Press. Thank you so much, Shailashri, for giving us your time. Uh, I, I just went through the paper that you uh, have written and the opening paragraph, I'd like you to elaborate and explain what you mean when you write that terrorism is one of the biggest tests of a democracy because the ability to abide by pre-commitment of governments, a state's pre-commitments to fundamental rights because it tests that ability. It induces higher levels of insecurity and greater willingness on the part of citizens to allow laws to be enacted, to allow legislatures to enact laws that allow secret trials, surveillance, even torture. And you believe that anti-terror laws often bypass constitutional and procedural safeguards thereby instituting a kind of a dual or a parallel system of justice. And unlike the, the unlike criminal laws that, that are punitive in nature, detention under anti-terror laws are preventive. They curtail individual autonomy, and that could include tapping phones, reading off email, and what is worse, putting you behind bars, merely on suspicion that you may commit an act that infringes on the security of the state. Would you elaborate on the, the big picture as far as India is concerned in the manner in which these anti-terror laws are interpreted and implemented? Sure. Um, yes, so um, what actually happens is that, um, you know, anti-terror legislation usually uh, enacted, it's against secessionist or uh, at the moment it's against these glo global jihadi groups. Uh, but what you actually find, including this, my study and other studies have shown that most of the enforcement and the mistakes that are committed in due process, uh, you know, where, where people who are put behind bars are put behind bars simply because they happen to be either a religious, ethnic, or uh, or a political minority, um, not necessarily because they've done they've committed an uh, an act of terror. So that's something that you find um, not just in India but elsewhere too. So in, in scaling justice, what I did was I actually looked at how preventive detention laws and Tada cases uh, were uh, implemented um, in India. And what I found was um, that the judges, that the, and, and I looked at just the higher judiciary, which is the high courts and the Supreme Court, uh, and, and I looked at all the cases between, two, um, uh, between 1950 and 2005. Um, and what I found was that, um, you know, uh, judges were actually uh, quite careful. What, uh, so, so Indian judges came out quite well in this, uh, in this entire study, because what the judge, an Indian uh, higher judiciary judge, he, uh, he or she is uh, sort of functions like an embedded negotiator. By that, what I mean is that um, the judge is both uh, is a member of the state institution, uh, but the judge is also influenced by the political wings, uh, also influenced as a citizen and a member of society. Um, and what the judges did was that they made distinctions between uh, those who, uh, between the petitioners who did not have separatist ambitions and petitioners who did. So if you were a Kashmiri or a Khalistani separatist, 
you were more likely to be um, uh, found uh, guilty. But if you were not, then um, if you didn't have those aspirations, then the judges did not find you guilty. So they were not automatically, you were not put behind bars and accused just because you happened to be a Sikh um, or a Muslim. Uh, and in fact, Indian judges were very, very careful when it came to Muslims um, who did not have separatist ambitions because they, they were more likely to rule in, 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 those pe in, in their favor. Uh, and they also actually focused on the facts of the case rather than having some kind of prior ideological or religious bias. Um, but at the same time, um, the, the courts tend to be very non-confrontational with the government. Uh, because they actually have a very complex and nuanced relationship with the government, with the institutional rules, with politics, and with the law. Um, so, you, which is why I call them embedded negotiators. Um, so, so I think uh, what uh, in the previous cases in the uh, in preventive detention and TADA, um, there was less likelihood of the minorities being um, subjected to. Um, any kind of discrimination um, by the courts, okay. but, the, but, um, but the situation changes with quota. Okay, now uh, many would argue that after 2005, and particularly after over the last six or seven years, the situation has worsened and deteriorated. Before I ask you this, if I just step back a little bit and you know go a little bit into the background. After the attacks on the World Trade Towers and the World Trade Center in New York, after 9-11, uh, after the 11th of September 2001, there were 140 countries, as you point out in your paper, who passed different kinds of anti-terror laws. And more often than not, these laws were passed without any debate. They were draconian. When you look at India, POTA, or the Prevention of Terrorism Act, was passed by parliament. This was the Vajpai government, the Atal Bihari Vajpai government in March 2002. And then you had the TADA or the Terrorist Activities Disrupt, uh, uh, Disruption Act. Uh, and then you had the UAPA or the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which is an act of 1967, but was amended during the, uh, the UPA government, the United Progressive Alliance government by Manmohan Singh in 2004 and 2008. And what do you see actually after the Narendra Modi government coming to power? Do you see the way the courts, the way the judiciary, the high judiciary have been interpreting these anti-terror laws? Are they really balancing the demands of national security with obligations, with democratic, democratic obligations to protect the fundamental rights and the fundamental liberties of citizens. And, and, and can you really today say that, you know, the constitutional checks on executive power are really in place to ensure democratic accountability? Yeah, I mean, these are very difficult questions. And, um, you know, the thing is that I have not actually um, done uh, any analysis of the UAPA um, um, uh, cases. So my cases ended with the POTA cases. But what I see is that there is a continuing deterioration from the pot, pot, what's happening in the POTA cases to what's happening in the UAPA cases. And what has actually happened under the Narendra Modi government in 2019 was that there was another amendment to UAPA where now you can have individuals being characterized as terrorists. And that's what they've done where they've sort of put behind bars a number of people um, who were protesters against the uh, CAA um, and, uh, you know, and various other, you know, and, and academics who sort of um, worked on Max Light uh, uh, issues and a whole, and even and journalists who've reported uh, from Kashmir. So you have a whole bunch of cases where uh, individuals are now being characterized as terrorists. But the problem here is that when you have a law that allows you to do something like that and where you have a law where it's not just the you know the notion of who's it what, what's a terrorist uh, a terrorist should be somebody with an intent to threaten the integrity security or sovereignty of india 
Now that is that was the definition in um, uh, in Porter, but um, uh, and in in, in UAPA. Uh, but but in UAPA, what you have is that intent that is likely to threaten. So this actually widens the scope and actually includes uh, offenses related to nuclear substances, radioactive uh, substances, and you. Uh, and attempts to sort of uh, do, um, you know, um, threaten the state or public functionaries. But what, but the definition itself is a very, very nebulous one, right? So, so a lot of people can be put inside this net of a terrorist. And it's not just organizations, but also individuals now who can be uh, classified as terrorists. And once you're classified as a terrorist, you can be put uh, you can be incarcerated for up to 180 days. And then there's, you know, and then there's a review committee which is set up by the government that is supposed to look at your case. So you don't even go to the court for any of these, um, you know, to, to, to be able to um, uh, sort of um, uh, access the uh, due process system. In India, we have procedures uh, according uh, to the law. And uh, the problem with something like that is that uh, uh, the procedure in this case uh, the legal procedure in this case is that the government committee is now going to look at whether somebody is a terrorist or not and whether they were likely to threaten. So I think uh, the civil liberties um, uh, organizations and all of us as citizens have to be very uh, watchful of something like this because one day they come for one person and just uh, and and there there have been all these um, uh, accusations that uh, if you speak out against a particular policy then you are seen as threatening the security of the state. But surely as citizens, I think we are allowed to speak. Um, Mind. And that's what a democracy is all about. Uh, and this, uh, these kinds of anti-terror laws uh, threaten freedom of speech, and they don't, um, you know, uh, they don't allow us to um, sort of um, uh, live our lives as full citizens. But at the same time, I am also, uh, you know, I also agree that a state has to uh, protect its citizens because protection. Uh, of the citizens is one of its key commandments. So the state itself has a very difficult task of being a, of having to balance protecting the citizen uh, uh, without um, sort of subduing uh, or silencing dissent. And most and and with these kinds of laws, it's not very successful. Um, it may protect the citizen, but it also silences dissent. That is the problem. Um, and the, yeah, you, you pointed out that instead of targeting secessionist groups, global jihadi groups, the brunt of the enforcement and, and the attendant mistakes uh, that have taken place have been borne by religious minorities, ethnic minorities, and political minorities. You have also pointed out that judges are not really free of majoritarian prejudices. They don't really act without fear or favor. You have pointed out that there are a disproportionate number of Muslims, for instance, who've been charged with terrorism and imprisoned while awaiting trial. And the propensity of the courts to align with the government of the day, the state. And what we've seen recently, the police action against students of Jawaharlal Nehru University, those who were protesting in Shaheen Bagh, those who were protesting in Northeastern Delhi, the manner in which uh, the police has been acting against those who uh, were venting their, their disagreement with uh, laws like the Citizenship Amendment Act. We see police action against such people. And as you have yourself pointed out, what is a terrorist act? This, the definition is so vague. Who is, uh, who is abetting a terrorist act? The abetment to a terrorist act, that too is very nebulous and vague. Uh, maybe you can add to what I've said. Yeah, I, I, I would actually say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that 
if you were to compare, say, the TADA and preventive detention cases with POTA cases, um, what you find is that in POTA cases, I'm not talking about UAPA cases because I don't have the data on that. But in POTA cases, Muslims were about 14.2% or so of the uh, population, uh, according to the 2011 census. They comprise um, almost 40% uh, of the accused in the POTA cases. And in about 65% of the cases with Muslim accused, uh, what the prosecution has done is, is it's framed it as a terror case. And over 80% of these cases were classified as Islamic terror. Now, what you find is that the minute the prosecution frames a case as a terror case, and as Islamic terror, the judges are, are going to give the benefit of doubt to the state because as i said one of the primary commandments of the state is to protect the citizen so the judges do tend to give more um, leeway to the state when cases are framed in this way and the worrying thing is that in both in pota and now also i'm sure in uapa if one were to do the research on, on those cases the framing of the case is going to be that this is islamic terror uh, and that's why the judges will tend to uh, favor the state. It's not that the judges are anti-Muslim, because in fact, when, uh, when, you, when, when you look at all the cases that the higher judiciary has um, ruled on, they have been very, very careful uh, with Muslim minorities, and they are not anti-Muslim. But it's the way the cases are framed that uh, where it's about terror, where the judge as a citizen becomes much more, and as, as a member of the state, uh, as a state institution, becomes much more wary and is the, willing to give the benefit of doubt. So I want to say that there is no anti-Muslim bias on the part of the judge in my data set. I have not found it. So I don't think... But, would, would, but would you go along when you look at an administration, when you look at a central government, which uh, believes in sort of Hindu nationalism, that's the... Uh, that's the position of the Bharti Janta Party. That's the position of the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh, which, though it calls itself a social organization, many consider that to be a, an ideological, the, par the ideological parent of the BJP. They have a certain agenda. Uh, uh, and, and a certain amount of what you might describe as Islamophobia is all pervasive. Today. I mean, I mean, I'm not being, uh, I think I'm not being uh, unique or alone when I say this. And, and, and the way in which the judiciary has been reacting, and because as you say, it is more often than not going to be on the side of the government, on the side of the state. Therefore, as I said, and as you have written, a disproportionately large number of Muslims are being charged with terrorism. They're being imprisoned, often without trial, and, and, and the propensity of the courts is to go along with the administration. Yeah. And, and so, but the thing is that I, but in my, in my analysis, when you look at, say, um, uh, the BJP was also in power, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as part of the, uh, as the head of the NDA uh, coalition. And what I found was that the judges were not ideologically influenced by Hindutva ideology when they were uh, coming when they were uh, giving their judgments. What changed their mind in in the cases that I was looking at uh, is after two thousand and one, the nine eleven attacks. It was this crisis caused by the threat to the security of the state, not an ideological inclination on the part of the judge that made them become more pro-state in their rulings. So I think it's important to make that distinction. And uh, so, But at the same time, I think when you have, um, you know, a majority government, uh, because at that time it wasn't a majority government, but now you have a, a majority government, uh, a government with a majority in parliament, which also uh, is uh, has this, as you said, uh, the Hindutva ideology, and has a particular um, uh, non-preference for for a particular minority. Um, you are going to find that that it's going to be much more difficult, I think, for judges um, to remain. Uh, 
untarred by that brush. It's, much, it's going to be much more difficult, uh, particularly because also you have uh, post-retirement appointments of judges. That's right. That, that's what I wanted to ask you, because that's what you've alluded to. After their retirement, judges are given appointments. We have the case of a former Chief Justice of India, now a member of the Rajya Sabha. Judges have been appointed governors and not just heading tribunals. So that is all of it, according to you, has complicated, I would say, compromised uh, the capacity of the judiciary to create a zone of autonomy and impartiality from the political arm of the state. Yeah. Could you elaborate on this? Yes, I agree with you that it has compromised it. And, that, and this compromising or, or this, this sort of undercutting of the judiciary has been going on for years and years. Uh, so it's not a new phenomenon. But I think uh, it is... Uh, because Indira Gandhi, too, uh, had shown a complete willingness to use executive uh, power to silence or uh, silence judges or transfer through transfers and other uh, and, and supersession uh, when she was in power. Right. So it was a single party majority government at that time. Similarly, uh, you know, this current government also, I think, seems to be willing to do these things. Uh, but and so the as I said, the judges are very. It's an embattled uh, um, um, institution, and it's one of these institutions where people still have faith in that institution, as compared to say the police, um, the army. Of course, people continue to have faith. Uh, um, uh, the judiciary, I think, the faith has been uh, coming down, uh, and there've been very uh, surveys on that. And the police, of course, it's gone away completely. Um, and so I think it's. And they're in a very, very difficult position. And it's going to be, um, I mean, as, as you've pointed out too, that, uh, you know, it's going to be actually, we, we, at the moment, I don't have the data, but we need to test whether the ideology of the party in power will actually matter because it didn't matter earlier. But now that it's a, it's a majority government in power um, and it's a Hindutva government, will it actually matter in when um, in these sorts of cases, particularly when uh, the cases are considered to be a national security threat. Uh, mm -hmm. Will that then make it even worse for the Muslim minority? Now with the POTA cases, you find that it is doing that. So I, I, I unfortunately, I think that particular trend will probably be seen in the UAPA cases too. And now that individuals can be now branded as terrorists, that is an even more um, uh, worrying, um, um, for, uh, worrying matter for all of us um, in terms of our civil liberties um, and in terms of how minorities are treated in this country. You know, you, you talked a little bit about uh, how courts allow for non-compliance with the requirements of judicial custody. Uh, ostensibly, it's a very urgent matter because uh, now what is urgent, you know, this is the whole issue. I mean, the notion of urgency is itself very nebulous and ambiguous. So uh, maybe you can comment a little uh, about this aspect of uh, the working of our judiciary. Sure. Uh, so again, in these POTA cases, uh, what's happened is that you find actually that, um, you know, the way in which, the not in very many cases, in a few cases in POTA, in POTA, but again, I think this is a pattern which I think will probably continue in UAPA cases when people do the uh, analysis. Um, what you find is that there is a propensity to allow more cases um, to come under uh, threat to the security of the state. Uh, you know, in Tada cases, actually, only um, about 65% of the cases were not threats to the security of the state. That's what the judges said. But in Pota cases, 60% of the cases are, are, the judges agree, are threats about threats to the security of the state. And with UAPA, we're going to continue, the, we, we may see an increase in the number of those signs of cases. Now that actually dilutes the protection of civil liberties and it also in some instances the court has allowed um, for non-compliance with the requirement for judicial custody uh, when the government says oh that it's a very urgent matter um, so you know um, we we can't really uh, put them in judicial custody we, we'll have to take them away somewhere and do what and um, you know uh, and the court has allowed that and that is even more terrifying because that literally removes every possible 
um, uh, safeguard that a person may have when they are um, arrested under these laws, under, uh, under anti-terror laws. Uh, Shailashri, I'd like you to make your sort of closing remarks and conclude our conversation. Many argue that uh, draconian laws like the UAPA really have no place uh, in today's day and age. Uh, it's like the colonial era law and sedition. It's about time these were scrapped, these were written off the statute books. What are your views? Yeah, I think I would agree with that. I think our big problem is we have all the laws under the sun. We can, you know, we just with our criminal laws, we can do, uh, the state can do a lot of things. But our problem is that the police itself is a, also an embattled institution. So you're not going to, so you need to find evidence. You need to go and collect evidence, right? So what you actually find is that they don't have enough um, uh, enough um, manpower and resources to be able to do all of that. And so when evidence collection itself is a huge issue, uh, you are not going to, um, um, uh, you, you're going to end up with a situation where you may, you would prefer to have an anti-terror law where you don't have to have all these strict um, uh, strict sort of boundaries that are around criminal laws, um, you know, because in uh, in anti-terror laws, you're actually given, uh, you meaning the, the police and the state are given much more leeway. So they would, that's why they prefer anti-terror laws to uh, criminal laws, even though India has a, such a huge um, a web of criminal laws set up by the colonial state, which didn't really need these anti-terror laws. They, they used the criminal laws to do all the things that uh, they, they uh, did with um, nationalists and, you know, calling them terrorists. And they used um, criminal laws for all of that. So uh, we don't actually need that. Uh, but I think the problem is that because the police and uh, is is so understaffed, under resourced, ha doesn't have the uh, the wherewithal to go around collecting the evidence. If people, the state finds it easier to have these kinds of laws, which give less, um, uh, which give them more leeway and um, uh, to uh, to arrest people on suspicion. Um, and, you know, sometimes they're right some, and sometimes they're wrong. And, but the thing is that even if they're wrong in one instance, it is the loss, it's a loss for an innocent life. And I think each life counts. Um, and I think that's where I think all of us as citizens come from is, um, you know, every life is important and you cannot, um, you cannot dismiss uh, one life in the interests of many. Uh, which is usually the argument used in, uh, used for anti-terror laws. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shalashri, for speaking with uh, with me and, and on behalf of the viewers of NewsClick. Once again, let me thank you very much for giving us your time and do keep watching NewsClick.